What's good, everyone? Welcome back to Through the Veil. I'm your host, Alex Nelson, and this is episode number four of the podcast. In today's episode, I talk with Savannah Freemeyer, and we talk about pleasure, sexuality, and relationships. This is a very interesting one. We really dive deep into some of the complexes that we all suffer from relating to and surrounding sexuality. So I hope you enjoy this one. If you do, Please drop a five-star rating if you're listening on iTunes, or drop a comment if you're on YouTube, and share this out to whoever you think could use this info. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Alright, so welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> you can. Glad to be here. Um, can you quickly introduce yourself, and then kind of go, you know, and couple sentences or a couple paragraphs, kind of what you do, um, what you're really into right now, and kind of what your areas of interest are. Yeah, so my name is Savannah Freemeyer from Kansas City. Uh, I feel like I was planted there um, <laughs> to expand outwards. Like I, the coast and chocolate place was like really inspired me, but I feel like my work is within Kansas City. Yeah. And I'm currently I am a massage therapist, I do integrative life coaching, so combining um, different modalities to create a holistic approach. I also do Reiki, energy healing, and I teach yoga. Yeah. Um, so I started with massage therapy, and uh, you know, just I noticed I started connecting with people, and talking to them, I could see things about them and help kind of guide them and I was like wow with life coaching is definitely yeah. something I've been doing like for a long time without knowing what I was doing. Yeah. And I using those four skill sets um, to I'm trying to wind them into what I'm currently interested in right now, yes. which is something I've been really passionate about like for my entire life, but it's been something that's kind of like kept in the closet. Yeah. And it's like sexuality and sexual authenticity. Yes. And the scoper when that we've been working with yeah. it really helps me articulate my mission, which is to help people find sovereignty by taking their power back yeah. and discovering their sexual authenticity. That's awesome. So like really what can we govern outside of ourselves if we haven't governed ourselves? Yeah. And um, being out here, like the being has definitely been like the divine and feminine. Yeah, absolutely. And like look at how much life can come around us, and like that life got here from sex. <laughs> so I think it's really divine, like to get in touch with your sexuality. Um, a little side project I've been working on is erotic literature. Yes, yeah. so I've been writing stories that have either like happened, like a little bit of embellishment. Right. You know, yep. I make whoever my partner is in the story yeah. like qualities. Yeah, so they're all first person. Mm -hmm. Point of view, yeah. um, which is it's interesting for me to get out there and actually talk about what I've experienced yeah. in the sexual world because my entire life, like I said, we kind of keep it in the closet. Um, Especially where you look at it. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, but I've been you know, shamed for it or mm -hmm. been made to feel guilty. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And start with my first journey yeah. through my sexual experience. Yeah. Kind of sets the tone for everything that has like happened right. up until this point. So I lost my virginity when I was really young. I was fourteen. Yep. Um, I went. You know, I came back home, and my parents knew okay. that I wasn't where I said that I was, and yep. the whole experience itself was pretty like traumatic. Yep. So I there's just something within me that was like, can you just get it? I just need to get it out. Right. And so I, they're, like, they were drilling me about where I was. Yeah. And finally, I was like, Still I screwed him. Yeah. And my, <laughs> my dad was like, what? what? <laughs> and my mom got up from the table and grabbed my hair and mm -hmm. hit, threw me into a wall. Wow. And she called me. Yeah. And another, another like, series of events that were really yeah. humiliating. Like, she took me to the hospital because she, you know, she wanted to say that it was rape. Right. And then the nurse was like, I can't do anything right. for you. Like, you have to go see a gynecologist. Yeah. And I mean, I'm grateful that that was brought up into the open because right. I did start like really taking care of my sexual health and yes. yeah, birth control. Right. Um, and then I was taken out of school for three days. Wow. And 
when I came back, you know, everybody treated me differently. And with my mom's words of, you're a whore, yes. <laughs> I, you know, when you're that young, you're so impressionable. Yeah, yeah, and so I was, I was like, well, I guess I'm a whore. Yeah. So I would be like in and out of really shallow relationships or I'd have sex with people, and I realized that I was doing that to come to a place of like validation. Yeah. And I thought, well, he's paying attention to me. He must love me. I must be worthy. Yes. Um, so it's been, it's been an interesting road with that. Yeah. Um, and then my most recent long term relationship, shaking me on both ends. Yeah. Uh, there was one day. I looked at the calendar and had a star on the calendar. Like, Who's a star? He's like, oh, that's the last time I had sex. Yeah. Okay, so, well, maybe I've been busy. Like, hey. how, how could I let two weeks go? Like, yeah. is, are you serious? That's really the last time we did? Right. So I'd initiated with him thinking, okay, look, I do care for you. I right. want you to know. And that was my way of, like, gifting him yeah. my love. And then he said, no, I can't stay because I, I just keep thinking about who he's going Yeah. So getting through yeah. that, um, but I think you know, pretty abrupt ending. Yeah. And, uh, I moved out as soon as my dad died. Yeah. That's a whole different yeah. <laughs> story. But since I've been out on my own, I've been like rediscovering me yeah. and being able to talk openly about my sexuality, which I'm sure feels it feels. Embracing, it's like the shackles are taken off and the weight is off your shoulders. Because I think shame is just one of the lowest vibration energies that anyone can feel and be in. Because it's so closed, you know, it's like you're like this, and you're kind of holding yourself close because you don't want to. You're just so in that emotion. So being able to share yourself like you just did and kind of start to integrate it as a piece of your journey is an equal thing. It's, it's a, I went through that, so I get to this place now where I want a story to share. And I'm sure plenty of people will hear this who have gone through a similar experience, because it's not an uncommon experience for a young woman from what I've heard, where her sexual partner goes really badly, and like their parents freak out, or someone else's parents freak out, and it's just a unfortunate part of our society. Is way too, way too common. Right, and then what happens when we cross it, when we like don't express that part of ourselves, which every animal, every life form, right. everything is always in a state of creation, which is sexual energy. Right. And I think people confuse sexual energy with like pornography or eroticism with the pornography right. that. But really, like that pornographic, that really violent form of like sexual expression is coming from repression. Yes. Like, look at the Catholic priests. Right. They're like, no, no homosexuality, no sex before marriage, no, no, no. But like, they're having sex with their altar boys. Yeah, exactly. And well, like, they're not, it's raping them. Right. They're against their will. They're repressed so hard that they're passion now. Whereas, really, the message should be having a body. You know, we are here to experience life, which is serious pleasure. It, life is meant to be pleasurable, and it's not an excess. Like, excess is the priests. Yes. Excess is, like, pornography. Right. Excess is um, sexual addiction. Yeah. But to, like, okay, well, I'm meant to experience this delicious food, and I'm meant to have sex. Um, and knowing that it's your body... Like, this is something I'm already teaching my 10 year old daughter. Yeah. Like, this is your body, like, it's right. for your pleasure. Yes. And if you want to include somebody else, like, lucky right. them, that's yeah. awesome. But it's it's all yours right. if you want to keep it for yourself. Yes. And I think that I'm teaching myself that as yeah. I'm teaching her. I'm like, wait a second. Just because you want to today like, doesn't mean I want to yes. today. Or if I have the experience to have sex while I'm here, I'm like, I will. Yeah, exactly. It's a, I love the food analogy because it's a great way to think about it, a great way to conceptualize it. That it's like if you have your favorite food, let's just do pizza as an easy example. It's pizza. Pizza's amazing, but if you ate it three meals a day every day, then you're in an unhealthy place. And same thing if you're on the opposite of the spectrum, like I will never touch pizza because it's evil. 
that's also a negative mindset. And so, all you think about is pizza. Exactly. And you're just like obsessed with pizza, but yeah. you can't have it. So. And then what you do in the dark with that pizza. Exactly. You're real weird. <laughs> you're fire in a row, and then the shame comes in because yes. you're hiding it from the world. So it is. It's a great analogy because it really, is, it really has a parallel to sex. But it's like, yeah, it, it is both sides of the spectrum. There's the repression side, and then there's the the validation seeking side, if you will, where you're seeking out, you know, as many sexual partners as you can, which is definitely a place I've been in my life in the past, where you know, I'm getting something from every one of those interactions that's just a short burst of validation rather than going inward, becoming who I'm supposed to be and validating myself first, and then bringing that into a union with someone else and sharing that with that person, which is just a much more beautiful thing. So. And then coming from a place of sovereignty, mm -hmm. like I govern myself, this is my body, yes. I know what I need, I'm comfortable expressing what I need, and then meeting up with someone else who's also sovereign can create something profoundly beautiful. Yeah, and exactly. I, that's, that's just something I'm leading in with my, my life coaching, so my ideal clients are, and I know there's a lot of them out there, yeah. <laughs> like are women that haven't been comfortable expressing that part of themselves mm -hmm. or have experienced shame and right. trauma and guilt and just an unhealthy relationship with sexuality. Mm -hmm. And I think that once they can develop that sexual authenticity, yes. and that comes from your root and sacral chakra, like you cannot move through that entire sacral or chakra system right. until you address this. Mm -hmm. And that's, you can't get to your heart, which is how, like where everything comes from. Right. And how are you going to connect with your spiritual self if you don't first clear yeah. this area? So I think that working with them there, I mean, obviously working with them throughout their chakra system, like how are you eating? Like what is your relationship like with your self-esteem? Like what what is your relationship with spirituality and, and even healthy eating and um, mental function? Yes. You know, those are still very important because it's... Yeah, it's part of a whole yeah. mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual whole. And I think it maps, right. it, yeah. it maps really nicely onto Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. Where you can kind of see as you handle some of these things health, food, water, sexuality then you can actually get into the more self actualization pieces. Mm -hmm. But if you don't handle those other ones first, you're not getting to the last part mm -hmm. because you're constantly in a state of trying to fix the thing that's broken inside that needs to just be addressed and healed. Yeah, and I think that once you know, they start working through that area, they realize how much power they actually have. Like, not just you know power to power all those other chakras, but like, oh my gosh, like sexuality and creativity are they come from the same place? Yeah. And creativity is what allows us to build the life that we desire. Like, really, if you're stuck here, how can you create something meaningful? Right. Um, another client base that I would love to work with mm -hmm. is couples. Yeah. You know, I talk to a lot of couples, especially like the, the men in the couple situation about how do I enhance this like sexual connection? How do I enhance my communication with my partner? Understanding attachment styles mm -hmm. and understanding you know, their sexuality as a team. Yeah. You know, because when you have your sexuality on your own, you have your own energy and you know, he or she has their own energy. When you bring it together, you start mixing those energies right. and starting to look at, like, well, how do those energies interweave? And yeah. how do we keep things balanced? Mm -hmm. And can Make I, sure one doesn't take what they Yeah. And I love working with couples. Yeah. Um, and then I, another you know, client base that I haven't worked a lot with, I've noticed a lot with my massage clients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I'll, I'll talk to them. Yeah. If they're open to talking, then, yeah. then I just get channeling. Yeah, like, exactly. and I'm like, oh, I don't know why you need to hear this, but I have to tell you. Like, it's 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 but men, mm -hmm. like being able to express their communication and their yeah. vulnerability and Absolutely. coming from that, like bringing in that divine feminine, mm -hmm. bringing in that softness. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's super huge. Even mm -hmm. our workshop the other day with Dr. Yes. Dan Engel. Where he's talking about the mystery mindset versus the mastery mindset, and sort of the masculine and feminine part of that. And I just found that really, really poignant for me, where I was just going, getting just so much out of it. Wow, this makes sense. This is a framework that can actually patch my understanding to a little bit easier. Yeah, so, it's a nice bridge. Yeah, absolutely. To have instead of just the, <clears throat> sorry, just the mystery 
Well, go into the unknown, like yes. go into the cave. Like that's where you're Diving finding. Diving feminine. Like what does it mean? What does that mean? Like can I get like a little roadmap? Yeah, exactly. To that? Yeah, I believe it's so important to balance those out. Like that is definitely part of my mission as well as balancing my own masculine mm-hmm. and feminine. How am I going to get into a relationship that's balanced if I'm not balanced? Yes. How are we going to balance the world yes. if we ourselves are not balanced? Um, you know, if everything is as within is without. Mm-hmm. So everything happens within us. If we have our own point of our internal universe. So whatever we see outwardly is what we need to fix yeah. ourselves exactly. internally. It's the reason you're noticing it. <laughs> yeah. So. There's a really powerful book. I actually brought it with me mm-hmm. as well if you want to check it out. It's yeah. called The Universe Loves and a Happy Ending. Gotcha. Which is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> fun plan words. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, but there's a part in there about the labyrinth of life and so you turn left and you turn right so it's a it's more like a rotation of a wheel of turning inward and turning outward sure. your inward movement your divine like feminine uh, energy has to be stronger than your outward form creating like mm-hmm. masculine energy because you know if you don't have that inward resource mm-hmm. Anything that goes outward right. is you're gonna have a burnout. Yeah, exactly. And you're gonna be imbalanced. Mm-hmm. And looking around, you know, the world, if we're continuing to just plow down like forests right. or just taking and taking, and um, what was really interesting was uh, when Dr. Dan said about extraction. Yeah. But um, he said, "How are we treating our earth?" Yeah. And I said, "Like we're treating our women." Yeah. You know, you go like. A resource to be plugged. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm going to try this one out. I'm going to extract what I need from it. Okay, I'm done. I'm going to extract what I need. And I'm going to get at the other end of that. So I I felt that. Mm -hmm. Um, But that, you know, that book, Universal, talks about the morphic field. Dan was talking about the morphic field. Yeah. yeah. It says, yes. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful sentiment, too, because I've Mm -hmm. noticed in my own life that I'm. I mean, even just recently, like leaving my job this last week, and one of the things that drained me so much is I had to be in that masculine role all day, every day, and I had no time to recharge and go inward. So even in my relationship, I would see it affecting. So I would just come home, and I'm just, I'm fucking drained. I got nothing. I'm just like, I just want to sit and stare at a wall for a while and kind of like be internally by myself. So now it's going to be a beautiful flip side to that, where I'm going to get to see spending you know four days out of the week working from home, being on my own. Taking some time to recharge that and kind of go inward, work on that mystery mindset, and then I'll have a little bit more to offer when my partner comes home. Okay. So let's jump into some uh, some tactics, okay. some nuts and bolts. So I think focusing on women specifically first, okay. what would be sort of your couple pieces of advice, or what's the first couple steps on the journey you would kind of lead someone down if they're coming to you in the Savannah? I'm all fucked up. <laughs> My sexuality is in a fucking sailor's knot, and I can't figure out how to undo it. What's the first couple of things you'd start to walk someone through? Um, something I found very important that was missing for a long time in my life was boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um, I came from a place of people pleasing, yeah, and you know, back to that validation. Mm-hmm. And really, I don't even know if I enjoyed the sexual experience as much as I could have because yeah. I did. I came from a place that wasn't like, pure, it wasn't like if there wasn't a boundary, it wasn't what I really wanted mm-hmm. to do. So learning to say no, yeah. but also learning to say yes. Mm-hmm. So being able to discern like, how does this feel within me? And that is a very feminine thing. Yes. Um, another thing, meditation and getting in touch with feeling. So mm-hmm. taking yourself out of this brain and moving into this and being able to go with the flow. Like yeah. even last night, you know, I was I was burnt out from I and mean, I love yeah. all of you. <laughs> yeah. And I love talking to all of you and having these deep conversations and it was really nourishing for my soul. But I knew, I felt with my body, I was like, I need to go to bed. That's exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. And so being able to listen to that and you know, today I feel like I'm re energized. Yes. I'm ready. Um so just being able to listen mm. to your body. Yeah. And again, taken out of that rational mind where I think our people pleasing does come at that logical, well, what are they going to think of me? Yes. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Like, I've been to this. So, yeah, listening to your body, boundaries, um, and self love. 
there's a really beautiful book. It's mm. the title is kind of awful. Yeah. Uh, it's called Men Don't Love Women Like You by yeah. Gio Lambert. And I really think even men would get a lot out of it. Sure. The first two chapters are like, this is what you've been doing wrong, like yeah. in your relationships, yeah. in your relationship with yourself. And it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> so okay, I'm guilty. <laughs> But there's one exercise in there that I, I love, and I think that so many women can benefit from it. Like, stand in front of a mirror and look at yourself and accept you for who you are right now. Yeah. And, like, love yourself now. Not, like, oh, I love myself from this angle. Yeah. Or I love myself when I have makeup on. Or I love myself when I suck my stomach, stomach yeah. out. Or um, I, I would love myself if only I didn't have this. Or yes. Like, you have to stand in front of the mirror until like all of those things are gone. Like he says, stand in front of the mirror until you're ready to fuck yourself. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> so, you know, cause then you can say like, you know, this is what I love mm. because now you know how much you love yourself. Yeah. So self love, mm. listening to your body instead of your rational mind and setting boundaries would be like a very, a great start. And yeah. then we can branch off into awesome. the other areas, but that is a great foundation. I thought it was, I can't remember who whose workshop it was yesterday. It might have been Dr. Dan's. Um, where part of it was just like giving thanks. No, you know, it was uh, Aubrey and uh, Maya's workshop. Yeah, part of it was like giving thanks to this body that has carried you through your entire life up to this point. And it has faithfully been with you every day and done what you asked of it. And although it's faltered at some points, you're still here. So it's like, even, I thought it was such a beautiful perspective because it takes, I think most people get stuck in the attractiveness part. They get stuck in how, how hot do I think I am? Yeah. And they don't do enough acknowledging of how fucking amazing it is that your body, this fucking mass of just like unbelievably complicated neural network and brain and body and heart has carried you this far in your life and done what you've asked it up to this point and is capable of so much. People that do spend time acknowledging that yeah. beauty of the body. It's like how fucking amazing it is that we're this fucking creature that exists and we can think and talk and have sex. It's like, whoa, what the fuck? What is this thing? How lucky are we? So And then even deeper than that, it's not just the physical aspects of like the neural pathways in the heart, but we have more, we're 99 point, like 12, nine repeating like percent space. Yeah. So it's like, how is this all being held right. together? Exactly. And I mean, I believe it comes from like the power of love. Sure. Yeah. You know, that, that energy that holds anything mm -hmm. and together and, and yeah. And then you're know, bringing sexuality into now you have a partner that also has this amazing body yeah. that's capable of all these things yeah. and functions that you don't have to think about while you're having an orgasm. Yeah. You're not like, how is this all put together while I'm doing this? I think this is how <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I get kind of nerdy with some yeah. of my partners and talk about that stuff. Yeah. But, um, so let's yeah. dig in then. That's, I think it's awesome advice for just like the feminine side of things. So let's dig into if you've got a couple that's coming to you yeah. and they're kind of asking you, like, what should we do? What's the first five you start? Is it communication? Is it. Oh, absolutely effective communication. Um, I just read a beautiful book called Attached. Mm. Have you ever heard of it? No. Okay. So everybody has um, an attachment style, okay. which is stable, but it's plastic. So like throughout life, like however you've interacted, maybe like with your parents mm. or other friends that like you have secure, anxious, or avoidant. Gotcha. And so I think one of the first steps to having a healthy communication is knowing yourself yeah. And there's a test in the book and there's tests online to yeah. find your attachment gotcha. style. Okay. And so from there you can work with, well, if this person is anxious and this person is avoidant, mm -hmm. here are the pitfalls. Yeah. And that's like a really volatile combination. Right. Um, so <clears throat> when you're an anxious type, your attachment style is I need to be close to this person. Yeah. You know, it goes back to like our ancestors that like, well, last time my partner went off, like right. without me, without him, like you didn't come back. Right. Like you got eaten by a tiger or yeah. something. And so you, that's your, your, your function. Yeah. And the avoidant type still has an attachment or like the security or security, sorry. Yeah, a lack the of word. Security. An attachment um, style. Mm -hmm. And you feel that need for attachment with yes. another person, but they shut it down. 
Right. Like they're like, nope. And they start pushing that person away and they look at it. like all the negative qualities of that partner so that they don't have to feel it. Right. You get those two together. The avoidance, like, okay, I'm, I'm backing away because mm-hmm. I feel this thing and I need space yeah. or I, you do this thing that I hate. Right. And this anxious person is like, where are you going? I like, I you need you. Me. Like, yeah. I love you. Yeah. And then the avoidant person is like, yeah. see, you're needy. Like, I can validate my independence right now because you're showing me that, like, yeah. you're crazy. Not with yeah. You right yeah. It's a total, you see it all the time where it's that, that relationship dynamic where one person's chasing really hard mm-hmm. and the other person's just like, whatever. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. And so unhealthy because they just, it is. they, bash off each other and both of them are getting negative energy out of it. Right. And right. so one <clears throat> one thing that you can do, like maybe the, the anxious partner, all they need to know, not avoidant partner, like mm-hmm. maybe they don't want to talk, the avoidant doesn't want to talk to you during their work day. And like sure. really they're busy. They're like, I didn't yeah. respond to your 50 text messages because I, I was haven't didn't even have my phone. Yeah. But there is a an example in the book, like if you just had even like a timed text message that mm-hmm. said like, Hey, I'm thinking about you. Yeah. Puts that anxious person at ease. Right. And they can back away. Yes. And the avoidant person can just, you know, express like, I need my space and something to do with you. Yeah. Back to the Just that communication. Yeah. yeah and, and boundaries. Um, secure types can kind of deal with both. Right. And can put an anxious person at ease mm-hmm. and can put an avoidant person at ease knowing that I'm not going to engulf you. Yeah. I'm not going to overstep yeah. your boundaries. I'm ready when you're ready. Yeah, but the beautiful thing is that it's it's plastic. Yeah. Um, I mean, it could be even a secure person getting into a relationship with an overly avoidant person and then taking on anxious yeah. things. But it's all about knowing where you are and being able to communicate right. with your partner. Yeah. Kind of trying to back to the inner work, mm-hmm. identifying you are the anxious type. There's no shame in that. Yeah. But what has caused you to be that way? What happened in your childhood? What happened in your early relationships that caused you to be in that anxious space? I yes. personally definitely feel like I've moved through when I was younger. I think my first girlfriend, well, I had like one girlfriend when I was like 13, so I was like, oh, I don't count. Like, no. <laughs> my first like real girlfriend when I was 16, she got me. And it was one of those experiences that put me into this neediness mode for a good couple of years until I started to build myself out of that and start to get into more of the avoidant mode. Because then I was in a space of more abundance and more, I had to build myself from this person, but I'm this person because I don't need any one person. I am just on my own, which I don't think was fully healthy either. And then I was able to build from there into more of a secure once I started to like have some of these sexual experiences. And then I was, okay, you know, I do enjoy variety, but what I want is not 50 new partners a year. What I want is some deeper connections. And I kind of moved into that secure energy. So it's it's good to know that there's no shame in any of the stages because yeah. what's caused you to be there is your past and your story, but that you can, like you're saying, they're plastic. You can move and, up through them. And noticing like when you do interact with somebody, because you can be great yeah. on your own. Like, I'm good, I'm good. Yep. I have this beautiful idea of love and relationships and then you get in one and you're like oh my gosh i didn't know i did that and like they it's beautiful because your partner can provide that yes absolutely but the wonderful thing is like you know with avoidance they don't understand like don't always understand like it's actually healthy to have an attachment like so codependency gets kind of a bad name it's like codependency is you know like enabling someone to continue their like bad behavior like, yeah. or like alcoholism being an enabler yes. but being able to depend yes. on your partner is actually incredibly healthy yeah. so we're, we're designed for that we're designed to become attached to our partner and from that place if you can build that foundation of effective communication mm-hmm. you actually can create two independent people that are better able to take risks and yes. go out into their own lives like they did a study with this one-year-old girl, and I've done, they've done several. This yeah. is like one example. They had this, this girl come in, and her mom was in the room, mm-hmm. and she was like, oh, she was out exploring like books and toys and was just really interactive with yeah. things and was taking the risk. Like she, she knew her mom was there, so right. she was able to go out. 
the mom left the room, they brought a caretaker. In. So she wasn't alone, but she did not. She was not attached to this caretaker, so just, and she cried, and she didn't want to move from her place. And so what they found is that if you're in a healthy, balanced relationship where you're depending on each other, yes. that you are able to take risks. Yeah. You have this foundation, this solid point. And so if you explain that to an avoidant, it can be life-altering. Yeah, they because do. they want relationships. Right. Like they're unhappy not being in one. Like yes. they, There's a lot of them in the dating pool that right. they want to date. Then they get in and they blame everything that they're unhappy with on their partners because they start deactivating mm -hmm. that attachment yes. response. And I love the term I heard at some point. Not for life for me or boy, but like this codependency, that's the negative side of the coin, but then there's co creation, that's the oh, positive that's side of the coin. Yeah. Because it just makes sense with someone else, you can make something more than you can make by yourself. If you're doing it in a healthy way, then it's this awesome energy where you're balancing each other out. You had a bad day, but I'm having a good day, so I can bring you back to normal. And I'm having a bad day, but you're having a good day, you can bring me back to normal, and then we rise because of that. Yes. Negative side of the coin is you can co create negative stuff, and that's more the codependency side. But yeah, you're totally right. The avoidant, like just hearing that makes you go, Oh, there's a value in that yes. that maybe I actually want. Yeah, and it's just how we're hardwired at mm -hmm. some point, but you know, we can change anything yeah. within ourselves. Exactly. Enough time and intention spent on it, you can really make some radical shifts. Sweet. Love that thought. Okay, let's dive into specifically if you're working with men. And some of the things you've noticed are sort of the common themes, just people you've talked to, people you've worked with, where you're like, a lot of men seem to have this specific problem. Um, I think just being in touch like, with that feminine. Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of men that, are, that come in that are just stress like they feel like they have the weight of like the world on their shoulders and um, yeah, it just I and mean, it just goes back to communication and knowing yourself like a lot of the things even with women that i've met like, translates to men like, yeah. you know men need to know how to set boundaries mm -hmm. men need to like be able to be vulnerable to experience things and knowing that it's safe yes that it's okay to do that and there's a specific example like i i've worked with a lot of men that haven't quite gotten over a past relationship yeah. <clears throat> and so working with like healing like understanding it's not all your fault and yeah. but it's also not all of their fault so right. coming to this realization that you know we all play our part yes yeah. And in that sovereignty and balance between masculine and feminine. Yes, the vulnerability thing's been, I mean, even just this year being in therapy service has been a huge thing for me. Um, even before that, a bit, but especially this first six months of the year where it's, you start to, as you are more vulnerable and you actually get positive reaction back from being vulnerable, you start to realize that it's okay. But up until that point, I was very much the type to be like, I'll take the whole weight of the world on my shoulders and I'll take care of everything. And I don't need any recovery because I'm a badass and I can be fine. And it's like just ignoring the feminine part and not leaning into it at all. And as I start to lean in more to my vulnerability, and just in conversations with my girlfriend or just conversations within the group where it's like, I'm having a shit day right now. I'm really not feeling good. I'm just tired. I'm drained. It's like you can use that. You know, to take a little bit of that weight off. It's yeah. just, oh, what's this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with Brene Brown. Vaguely. I haven't read okay. any of her stuff. Um, so. Well, so she, vulnerability is where we get our creativity mm -hmm. and our innovation. And it's, it's also, yeah, being able to say, like, this is. Is where I'm coming from, right? And being able to look inward. It's free it's just, too. It's, you just end up in these when you're not being vulnerable, and then you're treating people a certain way, and they have no idea why you're treating them that way. So if you're in a really negative headspace, and then you're lashing out at people, when they're pissed off, like, wow, Alice is being a dick to me right now. And when you're vulnerable with them, 
oh, Alex is being a dick to me right now, but it's because his grandma just passed away yesterday. Right. Oh, okay, that makes no sense. Now I'm going to just kind of support him instead of flash back out at you. So it's a negative reinforcing cycle that some people get into where they get into a negative mind space, but they won't be vulnerable about how they're feeling. So then they, you know, kind of like you were saying earlier, as within, so without, within I'm negative, then I'm projecting that onto you. And then you react negatively back to me. And that reinforces in my head that there's just this cycle going on. I'm like, well, yeah, the world does suck. Everything is terrible. I was right. And just kind of this vicious downward spiral. Yeah, where you can stop it and say, like, stop. I, need, I need space. I need, yeah. And that goes with boundaries. Yes. Um, she also said something really profound, like, with men's shame. Uh, that, like, a, a guy came up to her and a husband of a wife and daughters that, like, loved her work. Yeah. And he's like, you haven't done very much work with men. Yeah. Like, what about men's shame? And she's, like, she's kind of caught off guard. And he's oh. like, they would rather see me die on my horse than fall off of it. Yeah. Like, so, right there, you know, you're not going to step down. Like, right. It was, it's shame. You're shamed for being vulnerable as right. a man. But knowing that, like, if you can work with that, that actually everybody would. Yeah. And things would just smooth out. And maybe your wife would actually understand. If yes. she knew that that's how you felt. Yeah. Like, we should treat you differently. And, uh, and come from a place of compassion. And come to the truth piece. It's, if she doesn't, that probably was never the right person in the first place. Right. So but that's hard too. Yeah, that's hard to come to that realization. <laughs> but that's some of the power of living in your truth and living in that vulnerability. Because if you can do it from the jump, then you'll filter those people out. But you know, the longer you've sort of not been vulnerable, the more difficult it can be to kind of dig in and be vulnerable. And that's where I think it's really helpful to get someone like yourself involved because you can provide an outside perspective. And someone, you know, even just normal therapy as someone to open up to that is a non judgmental third party who can go, I hear you. That is difficult. And that at least can start to get the ball rolling because it's, it's a big ask to get someone that they've been married for 30 years and they've never been vulnerable their entire relationship to kind of kind of just flip the switch and go, yeah. hey, uh, I'm really unhappy right now. Yeah. Well, it's someone to practice with. And just yes. someone to hold space. Mm-hmm. And then part of the life coaching structure that I work with yep. is, you know, again, balancing out mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. Yes. So they're like hosts in your temple. Yes. Absolutely. And if one is unbalanced, like the rest of them are unbalanced as well. Mm-hmm. And something that I've noticed in my own life, and I'm sure, you know, just as being human, like yeah. we're meant to, we're social animals. Like we create relationships. And I'm sure you've noticed as well, like your relationship. So if your emotional state is like on top of the world, like everything else like rises up with exactly. it. Like you go to work, you're like, I'm just happy. I'm having orgasms. I'm like, my partner loves me. I yeah. feel love. If your relationship has gone to shit, like you found out your girlfriend cheated on you yeah. or, you know, that you just had a fight with your partner before yes. you went into work, it takes a toll yeah. on everything. So if you can get that part secure yeah. and you're not like in this back and forth right. or, or even if you're not in a relationship, like if your relationship with yourself isn't good and you're mm-hmm. constantly seeking out, like you're spending so much energy, like why doesn't he, because he called me, yes. why doesn't he like me? Why can't I meet anybody? Mm-hmm. Then everything else like yeah. goes underway. So I've just noticed that that's something that I, I personally want to put focus on yeah. in my business and my own life because and everything else yeah. can raise up. I think it's an interesting thing that's kind of coming to me that the the thing that affects you so deeply when you're in that sort of Venus state is a sense of am I not, you know, am I worthy? And if I'm not worthy, that translates to everything in your life. So if you're not feeling worthy as a person in a relationship, that's such an important spot to feel worthy. It's so all encompassing that how do you expect to feel worthy of the promotion at work? How do you expect to feel worthy of going after that job that you really crave and the one that you think you want? How do you expect to feel worthy to go to the gym? How do you expect to feel worthy in all these other areas? So it's really important to do that internal work because that's, yeah, most people can put on game face for a couple of weeks, but then it falls apart and then it gets even worse. And I was talking with uh, my friend Natalie She's a holistic health coach. She's like diet nutrition specifically for women. Um, one of the things she said that really impacted 
back at you. It's just that the the reason diets fail so often is because they reinforce a negative cycle where someone tried, they haven't done the internal work and acknowledged what's really going on and they'll do a diet for two weeks. They quit. Then they feel even worse because now they're a quitter as well as not being on the diet. Right. And it just cycles downward. And it, it's the reason it doesn't stick is they're not doing what you're talking about, which is that ground level internal work that is just so important. Yeah, you just do the inside out, outside in. You know, if you are reminding yourself that you're worthy and, and showing yourself love, yeah. then yeah, then you're like, well, I'm doing this diet because I love myself. Right. I'm not doing this diet because I don't love myself and hoping I love myself yes. while I'm doing it. Um, yeah, sharing that because yeah. it's it's something that I've definitely felt. Yeah. I've fallen off like routines like. Like the exercise routines, or you know, and not knowing why, not not because I'm not like, disciplined, yes. but like, oh, do I really deserve more? Yeah, and then you have to beat yourself up. <laughs> Man, do I suck? Yeah. No, it's good. Whatever happened in the past just caused me to be a certain way right now. It's okay, mm-hmm. but I need to figure it out first. Right. Something else I've been diving into uh, is. You know, eroticism and pleasure, not in the way we think just sexually, yep. but if you're not feeling pleasure from your job, yep. if you're not feeling pleasure from your where you're living or what you're doing with your life, like what are you doing? <laughs> like you're gonna see displeasure outside of you if you're not working on like what what will give me pleasure? Like last night, like what gave me pleasure was going to bed and sleeping for ten hours. It was great. <laughs> Or even just yesterday, we did the uh, 10 minutes call, the sweat lodge. Mm-hmm. And I got out of that sweat lodge and I had a piece of fruit oh from the gosh. table. And it was like a never fucking eaten fruit before in my life. And I was just like, wow, what is this? This is so good. And that's just like such a simple thing. But I think we can all craft that mind state around right. so many things. Without having to have the contrast of you know, sweating your ass off. Suffering. <laughs> yes. The deep suffering. Yeah. But you... I think also understanding that that is necessary yeah. too, that and that's part of feeling yeah. and even part of pleasure mm-hmm. uh, is having a little bit of that like pain and understanding that it's happening for you. Yes. Um, even into eroticism, there are some things that I think getting in touch with your erotic mind, mm-hmm. how that mind works, will show you why you've been picking relationships that you've mm-hmm. been picking. So there's four cornerstones to eroticism. Yeah. Things that like turn us on. Like, I don't know why this is turning me on, yeah. but it is. So the first one is um so we'll, we'll say we'll start with the power struggle. Yeah. So let's say you know there's that polarity mm-hmm. of like, well, this person is like kind of dominating me yeah. and I'm being submissive, and but there's like love there. There's mm-hmm. that like well, I'm showing how much I love you by being submissive. And this dominant person is like, this person really loves me. They're letting me do this and yeah. they're trusting me. Uh, violating prohibitions is probably a common theme yeah. in mind. So having sex outside right. or like somebody could see you yeah. or we cheating on a partner. Rings. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing it. Like there's that little bit of guilt and anxiety, which you can actually in small doses can be an aphrodisiac. Yeah. Uh, there's overcoming ambivalence. Mm. Like let's say... This is an example from, from my yeah. own past. Like, I had a neighbor that was like trying to, you know, bark up my tree, and I was yeah. like, no, no, no. And he's like, well, we can have a lot of fun. And I'm like, okay, sure, All let's right. try. And then, it was, and then it was great. But yeah. then I was like, no, I'm still not really yeah. interested. In <laughs> um, and then the longing and anticipation mm-hmm. is another one, too. Yeah. I think sometimes we put, and that was a big one for me, I'm starting to address that one. Yeah. You know, like if you're, if someone lives far away, mm-hmm. or like you have that, um, well, I don't know what I'm going to see you next. Yeah. And but then there's that sense of like, there's always a possibility of rejection, mm-hmm. and I think that that is that turns you on a little yeah. bit. But it can be very detrimental to yes. your life. Like I just came out of something mm-hmm. like that where it was like this long anticipation of like seeing yeah. this person, yeah. and like counting down the days, and then the anxiety of like, well, what if he decides he doesn't want to see me? Right. And like, but the, it was unhealthy because I was obsessive. Yep. I was like 
we were texting constantly yep. and Zoom calling, and it was just there's so much like I would see him and like mm-hmm. everything, but I, so I wasn't getting my things done. Yes, and so being able to understand like, well, why why can't you be balanced with like maybe somebody that's here? Right. Like you don't need that money yep. and anticipation. And so it's it, it's definitely stepping into a gray unknown. Yeah, you, but that's where all the beauty can happen. Like if it's gray yeah. landscape and you're like, I don't know what's out there. That's when you can actually color and how you want it to be. It's just a blank canvas. Right. Really. But it's, it's understanding what turns you on yeah. to know how you operate inside of a relationship or how yeah. your sexuality could be like either really beneficial right. or where it can be detrimental to your overall well-being. Yeah. But, uh, definitely. It's interesting that all of them also have a flip side and just being aware of each of those cornerstones of bronzism helps you to be aware of, like you said, when you're being unhealthy with it or when you're being healthy with it. Because it could be the healthy version of what you're talking about where it's like, oh, I haven't seen this person in a really long time. Like maybe once a week, we just like have phone sex and that's awesome. And then I get to see them after five months and it's just like super hot and awesome. Yeah. But if it's too far the other way, then it's this obsessive thing where it's mm-hmm. nonstop. Boom, 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 boom. Same thing for the domination versus submission. Submission. It can be healthy. Yeah. Or it can be the flip side where it's like seeing. I can, I've got one relationship with a friend that I can think of in particular where it's just very much like she sits at home, does nothing, mm-hmm. guy does everything, and that's the relationship because they're both in this back. They're locked in this position, which probably at first serve them in kind of a sexual way, but over time it becomes very negative. Right. So. And you can switch your partner's right. role with that. Like I think it's fun to sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. be the one that cracks the whip yeah. and is dominant. But then there's times because I have so many responsibilities mm-hmm. in my life that I just want somebody to yes. show me and I so want to be able to open. surrender. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, even the violating prohibitions. Like, yeah. That's something that can keep a spark in yeah. your sexual relationship. It's like, oh my gosh, yeah. like, let's have sex in this alleyway. Yeah. Or like, hey, you know, we haven't, like, had sex by the lake in the car in, like, a long time. Like, you know, or, like, my friends in the next room over, right. and they can maybe, maybe they can hear me. Or, I left the window open. Yeah. Oh, it's, like, negative flip side. Yeah. Which I've seen people that say, oh, they're out seeking random sex, which is fine. I got no problem with yeah. that. But they're seeking it in a way that's very unsafe because right. that's the violating prohibition. Oh, yeah, no, we'll just not use a condom. And so, yeah. all right, that's something that should probably be shared with you and a partner that you trust, and not just someone you just met. But they're doing that. They're trying to violate. They're getting something from it. That's why they're doing it. It's not a thoughtless behavior. It's just a subconscious behavior. Yeah, but if so. you're not in tune with that, like so many people don't, it's going into the cave. Yeah. Some people don't know that like that's even there operating them. Yeah. Yeah, if we are pleasure seekers, like if that's what we're designed for, we're either like trying to avoid that pain or trying to like go towards pleasure. And right. if you're just letting the program run without your consent, then you will run into the same types of relationships. And it was really interesting some of the stories in it's the erotic mind by Jack Morgan, I think his name. Um, that there's a story of a woman who started really evaluating what was turning her on and mm-hmm. what what was going on in some of her relationships and the current one that she was in. She started changing herself, mm-hmm. and then she was no longer really attracted mm-hmm. to her partner yeah. because those systems weren't attractive to her right. anymore. And and that's or it can also help you. Get closer with your partner right. because you're like, okay, I haven't had sex in over a year, and I don't, I didn't know what what it was, yeah. but I need this element. Yeah. Like, Is can we add a little like, anxiety? Yeah. Can we like role play or like meet each other in a, a public place yeah. instead of like going together to it? Um, so I think it's it's very valuable because yeah. again, if your relationships are shit or if you just can't find yourself like attracting a healthy partner and you're like, you think something's wrong with right. you, it's going to affect everything in your life. Yeah. I'm just looking at that pattern. Kind of right. that so getting towards the end here. Um, people ask a couple things I'll ask. So what's the thing you're most excited about right now going forward? What's the thing that right now just like 
you wake up in the morning and you're fucking vibrating with energy that you're working on? Um, definitely the neurotic yeah. literature and being able to, you know, be on something like this to express myself. I'm yes. not hiding in the dark anymore. Exactly. I've been putting posts out on Facebook or Instagram, like this is this is what I believe, this is who I am, like, hello, here's a a light. So like and also just my own pleasure. Yeah. Like waking up, what is going to please me? Like Mm -hmm. where am I not in balance? And um finding pleasure in everything, like that fruit. Yes. And um even just my my friendships, they're finding Mm -hmm. pleasure in what it means to be a mom and finding pleasure in my work. So being you know, a pleasure activist, yeah. like is what gets me excited. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, so before we wrap up, uh, where can everyone find you? Instagram, Facebook, what's the best way to yeah. kind of reach out to you? Um, um, my, so my Instagram handle is at freespirit.rose. Mm-hmm. Um, I put a lot of more of my juicier things up there. Yeah. Um, but also Facebook, if you want to add me on Facebook, mm-hmm. Savannah Freemeyer. Gotcha. Um, and then I'm, I'm working with a little bit on my website, but it's savannaroselifecoach.com. You can find all my email addresses and stuff on there and also as well. But Instagram is probably like the best start because it has all that other info on there. Instagram slot. Yeah, it is. (laughs) So yeah, I'm working working on my practice of gratitude. One of the things I like to wrap up each podcast with is just saying that I appreciate you for being on here. I appreciate you coming with your truth. Um, Just being so open and it really is, to me, it's one of the things that is, as a woman, I think it's a beautiful thing that you're being so brave with going into this, what has been a heavily stigmatized area of sexuality. It's so needed. So I just want to say I really appreciate you for that. And it's an amazing thing that you're doing. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of value both out of this podcast, but just all the work you're doing. So I just wanted to thank you for that, for being on my Thank you for having me and letting me express that and articulate all the things that are <laughs> going yeah. on in here. And I do think that in the world would be much happier if we just addressed what makes us human. Yeah. You know, what what connects us with nature. And then we can really make some big, big changes. Absolutely. It's a beautiful note to end on. <laughs> so wrap it up here. Thanks for being on. Thank you. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I really learned a lot in this one and really gave me some new ways to think about things about my own sexuality and the sexuality of other people. Uh, If you did enjoy the episode, please give this a five-star rating if you are on iTunes. It really helps other people to find these episodes. And as well, if you don't already have me followed on Instagram, you can follow me at Alexander Diesel. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you next time.